And Father God, this night, we do want to thank you, Lord. We do want to praise you, Lord, for many of the the great praise and worship songs that we sing, Lord, we've sung over the years, come directly from your word, Lord. And the, these songs uh, speak the truth of the word of God, Lord. And we pray, Lord, even as we sing the word of God, Lord, you, you have been moving and ministering your truths into our hearts and lives, Lord. We thank you for the moving and the working and the comfort and the leading and the guiding of the Spirit, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that your word... Uh, becomes a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path, Lord. And in this dark world, Lord, we thank you again for shining your bright light and leading that way, Lord. And even as you covered the children of Israel, Lord, with that cloud by day, and you shone your, by the light at night, Lord God, uh, you made provision, Lord. And as you made provision for them, you've made provision for us, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity you give to us to worship you, Lord, this night in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray, Lord God, that as you move and minister right here in our midst in the chapel, you might be moving and ministering, Lord, to those uh, who might be watching via the internet, Lord, and we thank you for this venue also, Lord. We thank you for all who participate uh, this night to come and to worship you, Lord, and truly we want to be a people of worship. We want to be a people daily coming after you, Lord, seeking you first your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord, just trusting that you're adding all things unto us, Lord. Do move, do minister in your faithfulness, Lord. Touch us in those areas uh, where only you know, Lord, we need your touch. We need your reassurance, your hope, Lord, your comfort, your strength, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness and love. Your mercy is new for us each and every day, Lord. And we thank you again for gathering us this night. Bless us as we continue to worship you now through the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord, amen and amen. Hey, praise the Lord, guys. Uh, we're going to be continuing in our study through the book of Exodus in Exodus chapter 13. If you'd like to uh, follow along either on your electronic device or in your Bible, uh, uh, just a tremendous, tremendous study through the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter chapter 13. Guys, as the children of Israel began their exodus from uh, Egypt, the Lord begins with a very uh, specific set of instructions. He begins here in uh, verse 1 of chapter 13. Uh, he says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every, uh, the firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. The Lord, it seems, almost uh, demands the firstborn offspring of every man and every beast. And, uh, and uh, you might think that, uh, uh, or ask why. You might think, why is he asking this? Why is he asking for the firstborn of not only the families, the children of the Israelites, but uh, even the first, uh, firstborn offspring of the, their animals? And uh, uh, I don't believe it's because he's greedy for gain or holding power over the people, anything thing like that. He wants them to uh, uh, listen to him speak, and they jump, and uh, they ask, how high you want me to jump, Lord? But really, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more like it's an offering to him, guys. The first fruits. It, uh, it really speaks of the first fruits of the womb, the first fruits of the, the animals that God had entrusted to them, uh, the firstborn, all uh, dedicated to him as an act of worship. And I think that uh, no matter what it is, uh, the firstborn child for uh, the people of the, the, the Eastern culture was very, very important. And as it is today, you know, children are very important. But he says all to be dedicated to him in, in an act of worship <coughs> as, as it is uh, uh, to offer the fruit of all he has entrusted or provided or given to us. And, you know, it, it, it speaks of not only that. Uh, I, I love uh, uh, in, throughout the, the first five books of the Bible, uh, we're, uh, we're told to offer up the first, uh, the first of the dough. And I think that's where that slang came in. Hey, uh, how's about that do re mi? Kind of meaning money. And, uh, but uh, uh, that do was the sustenance of life, the bread of life. And, and he says, all that I've given to you through the, uh, through the crops and through the grains that you have, he says, bring to me in an offering of worship. And again, uh, uh, 
he says, bring the first fruits uh, into the house uh, of the Lord. And, you know, we give. Uh, that's why I, I think that uh, no matter what, when we, uh, when we get paid, and most of us work, we have income coming in or whatever it might be, but we bring the, uh, the offerings into the house of the Lord as, as an act of worship of what he's entrusted or provided or given to us. In verse 3, he goes on, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day which uh, you went out, of, out from Egypt, from the house of slavery by a powerful hand. The Lord has brought you out of his, this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. The reminder is deliverance from the house of slavery, which e Egypt is representative of, guys. You see, from the very beginning, Egypt is represented as an imposing place of abundance and of power. Egypt is also because of its rich fertil fertility associated with Eden. Yet, uh, the same time, at the same time, it's connected with Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of bad stuff was going on. You might say a lot of bad juju was going on. They were worshiping other gods and they were worshiping uh, other things and other animals and so on and so forth. But again, the things of the uh, going on, like the goings on of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, you can almost compare it to what was going on in Egypt. It's a tempting place where there may be both, both uh, material gain and personal demise. You know, some guys are so greedy for that personal gain. Uh, that it can really eat, eat away at you, it can destroy you. I think that as we look at Solomon, he was the richest, the wisest man in the world. He was a builder of great pro uh, projects and great building projects. Uh, he had many uh, uh, riches and flocks and herds and many wives. And, you know, these the excesses that within uh, his life uh, really led to his downfall and his uh, almost his demise, guys. And, you know, until uh, the Lord brought him to a place of repentance. And at times, you know, the riches uh, of the world, whatever the, the riches the world offers you, it could be pleasures, it could be wealth, it could be power beyond uh, we could think we imagine. It draws away uh, us uh, from the simplicity and the purity of devotion that we have from the Lord. And I think that, you know, um, day by day we... we come to the Lord day by day we say hey Lord thank you for your daily bread thank you for the provision that you've given and you know um, uh, it's difficult because most of us we have a, a roof over our head and you know at times I've been on the waterfront and you know the guys uh, uh, living uh, without a home have joined us and you know you think that hey these guys love the Lord but, you know, they just don't have that roof over their head. And we don't understand that some have moved from homelessness into uh, having a place and so on. Yet others are still, there. there's so many out there uh, uh, houseless and without, uh, without a roof over their head. Uh, this, this one fellow that I'm kind of thinking about, you know, he had his vehicle. You, you know, he had mobility and uh, he had a lot of stuff piled on his truck. And... Uh, uh, but uh, it was something that uh, he did have a little bit of shelter, a little bit of security. But Exodus uh, becomes a point where Egypt is portrayed representing bondage and oppression. Guys, uh, from a place of refuge from famine for Jacob and his family, a place of bounty and sustenance and self-preservation. Uh, you know, uh, for the, the children of Israel, for the children of Jacob. They went into Egypt, some 70 strong, and they came out with 600,000 uh, 600, men at the end of 430 years. Egypt had really been a place where the nation of Israel had been preserved, it had been nurtured, it had, it had uh, uh, grown uh, abundantly, guys, because of the rich provision and shelter that God had given them uh, uh, through the, the nation of uh, Egypt, guys. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, it, it became a place, that place of sustenance and preservation to a place of bondage and oppression. Egypt flip-flops, but leaning towards the negative and destruction. You know, Egypt is, uh, a lot of times, is cast in a bad light. And uh, uh, for we as Christians, uh, that old life, that old life before Jesus Christ, Many liken it to our, our, our life uh, as we lived in Egypt. We lived in bondage. We lived uh, to the pleasures of sin, and we were held in death uh, because we were enslaved to sin there in Egypt. Uh, verses 4 and 5, he goes on. But on this day, the month of Abib, you should uh, 
you should go about to go forth. And when the Lord brings you out of the land of Canaan, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this right in this month. Uh, the term or phrase, a land flowing with milk and honey, guys, is used 14 times in the first five books uh, of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, uh, it's called. But uh, this, this phrase, a land flowing with milk and honey, when you hear a word or a key phrase that's repeated over and over again, it bears to reason that God is trying to uh, emphasize a point. God is trying to emphasize uh, this land that is given to the, uh, the children of Israel is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's used 14 times in the, uh, the, the, the five, book, five first books of the Bible. It's also used in Joshua, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Uh, speaking of the land of uh, uh, Israel, guys. Passages found in Deuteronomy 8, 7, and 9 describes the land as abundant with water. It's a place where wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey is, you know, there in abundance. So this land of Canaan, this promised land that the Lord has promised to the children of Israel sounds like a very fruitful place. It sounds like a place of abundance. So, uh, milk and honey summarizes the lush, lush conditions of the land. The 12 spies declared the land does flow with milk and honey in the book of Numbers. Remember when the 12 spies went in? They did agree that, hey, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. You know, um, most of the spies said that, hey, but there are giants in the land. And, you know, they were controlled by what they saw. They were controlled by fear of these, these, uh, these awesome giants that, that wandered the land. But they did summarize the land does flow with milk and honey. Milk next to bread, guys, was an important staple uh, of the diet of the Hebrews. You, when you think about it, you have lots of flocks and you have herds of cattle, herd, flocks of sheep and goat. Uh, you can, of course, eat some of the animal, but what is a real sustainable resource that come from these herds? Milk. Milk, uh, you know, the, the cattle give milk, the sheep and goats can be milk. They can be made, made into cheese, uh, they can be drunk. And I know that they, they use all kinds of ways to preserve milk, including uh, drying milk and uh, you know keeping it for future uses but milk was a real important uh, staple in the diet of the Hebrews a land that produced an abundance of milk had to be rich in pasture land and it paints a picture of successful farming you know um, unless your cattle and your, your sheep and your goats have enough pasture unless they have enough water they're not going to give an abundance of milk you know uh, I, I think that what, what happens when you live in a dry and desolate land, the animals barely have enough, can produce enough milk to sustain, you know, their, uh, the, the kids, the lambs and the calves and so on. And uh, little, uh, uh, more, uh, and, and not enough to really give an abundance to where the human population, the masters can take advantage of what uh, the milk production is. But again, the uh, milk really represents uh, a land that's rich in pasture and paints a picture of successful farming or husband, animal farm husbandry. Honey was valued for its sweetness rather than a necessity of life. Uh, who, uh, but rare enough to rank as a luxury. Honey was a luxury. You know, uh, honey was a luxury, and both portrays images of desirability and abundance and suggests total satisfaction. Honey was that little bit of sweet that after a big feast, after a big celebration, maybe you had a little piece of honey on your, your bread, and that was your dessert, and you just went, wow, what a fabulous feast that was. There is a little bit of a sweet of the land that I have. There is a little bit that my... My master has allowed me to have. There is a little bit of the host treating his guests to something so sweet, a luxury in life. Uh, both portray images of desirability and abundance to suggest total satisfaction. The, the Lord says, hey, I'm bringing you, you, you into a place that flows with milk and honey. And it suggests a fullness uh, which surpasses all need in contrast to a dry and barren desert. Uh, 
you know, uh, Egypt was really a place where the, the people of Israel thrived. They grew, the nation grew. But yet it was something in, in slavery. And I think that uh, what the Lord paints in this picture of a land flowing with milk and honey, it says there's a fullness, there's an abundance of good things, of good pasture land. There's an abundance of shelter. There's an ab abundance of, uh, of, uh, uh, of produce for the land to feed not only yourself, but your animals. There's an abundance of fresh water uh, that can sustain you. And water is really the giver of life. And without that water, the animals couldn't survive. Without that water, the crops and the grains couldn't grow. But again, that land flowing with milk and honey really paints a picture of desirability and abundance and suggests total satisfaction on behalf of the recipient. And I think that as we've come into that place where we have a relationship uh, with the true and the living God, Jesus Christ, he's, he's brought us into that place of fullness of joy and love and uh, uh, these are the things uh, that sustain us. And these are the things, you know, um, unless we get greedy ourselves, you know, we can be satisfied with the abundance of God's love and the abundance of God's provision and the total satisfaction of the fullness of joy which is found uh, in the love of Jesus Christ, which is found in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He goes on in 6, uh, For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and uh, on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any uh, leaven be seen among you in all your borders. And you shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it, it shall be a service as a sign to you on your hand, as a reminder on your forehead, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. The Lord is so good to instruct his children that the festivals that are celebrated were that they would never forget what God has done in delivering them from Egypt. It became a continual reminder. You know, in the law, of, uh, the written in the, the book of the, the law, the Torah, it says that hey, three times a year your, your people, your men shall come before uh, me and worship me during these festivals, during these times of festivities. And it, it was again designed that we would never forget what, is God, what God has done in delivering us from Egypt and uh, the, this house of slavery. For the Christian guys, Egypt representing that old life we live, enslaved to sin, which has brought us death. And you know, uh, unfortunately for many of the Jews, the, the festivals became just a, a religious act that we go and we go to the temple, we throw our offering in and uh, so on and so forth. Oh, we get to see our friends. Oh, we get to have a nice meal. Oh, this and that. But in that, you know, in that religious road, just going through the motions, the Lord really desired, what he desired was a heartfelt relationship that, that, uh, uh, that the realization of God had brought deliverance from sin and death and the bondage, uh, it would turn into a, a, a loving relationship that they say, oh God, you're so good. And, and I thank the Lord that, you know, as uh, the Holy Spirit has in, illumined our hearts and opened our eyes, we, we can come to that place where we say, oh Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving up your life for us. Thank you for saving us and thank you for delivering us from that old life. And, uh, and, and until the Holy Spirit came upon us, we never really fully realized what the love of God was and what his joy was and what salvation really meant. Uh, we may have gone to church, we may have carried our Bibles around and we may have done good works and threw, uh, uh, threw in some change into the offering or whatever it might be. But God wanted us all in. He wanted all of our hearts in, in that we would dedicate our hearts and lives to him. And uh, it may not come overnight. It may be a gradual process that uh, God is weaning us uh, out of the world and taking us and separating us more and more each and every day as we consecrate our lives to him more and more each and every day. But he goes on in 10, he says, Therefore you should keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. And now uh, it shall come about when the Lord brings you uh, to the land of Canaan, 
uh, to the land of the Canaanite as he swore to your fathers and gives it to you that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first, uh, the, but every first offspring of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of men, you, your sons, you shall redeem. And when it shall be, when your son asks you uh, uh, in time to come, saying, what is this? What is this? Then you shall say, with the powerful hand, the Lord brought out of Egypt from the house of slavery. You know, I think ingrained into the hearts of many Jews, as they, though they might be atheists, though they might be practicing other relationships, I think be, within the heart of many Jews is that, that uh, goodness of what God has done for them in their behalf. Deep down, they might try and suppress it and say, yeah, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that. But I think that the reminders have been there for time and time again. and. Be because of this, you shall keep this appointed festival as a reminder uh, to our devotion to God. For the child of God in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit is a reminder of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We are, uh, we are urged on, not by days on the calendar or festivities or days of worship, because uh, we are now a people of worship. Our hearts are devoted, not only on the feast days, but daily we can choose to come to Him in worship. And you know, that daily thing is the greatest thing you can do. The greatest thing we can do is start off the day with a word of thanks, a word of prayer to the Lord daily. Uh, we can look at, you know, a small portion of Scripture and say, hey God, what do you got for me today? And I just love uh, going to, one, you know, a proverb but day. I love going to a portion of Scripture here or there and uh, I, I try and uh, leave the house early enough to where I can get into the Word before work and uh, uh, throughout the day, sometimes on a break or, or when you, you really need it, you can just cry out to the Lord no matter where you are and uh, just get me through this and get me through this difficult time and get me through this difficulty. And sometimes the Lord just calls you to remind you, hey, I passed you on the road, you know, and I, uh, I just wanted to call and say hello and uh, uh, this and that. And, you know, it, it's something out of the blue at times. And uh, God is so good. The Holy Spirit is God's reminder of His love for us in Jesus Christ. We are we're urged uh, to daily have that walk. We're urged to daily to choose to come to Him in worship. And I would, uh, I, I would hope and pray that, uh, again, you know, as that word, we, we, we use this word engage, our lives will be engaged in Him, and that we can pray, and we can pray as we uh, wash the dishes, we can pray as we brush our teeth, we can pray driving, we can uh, 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 just uh, say, hey, Lord, uh, you brought this person to mind, we can pray for this person, we can do this or that, and you can go on your prayer walks or whatever it might be, or your prayer drives as you... You ask the Lord to pour out your spirit upon certain places and areas and people and so on and so forth. But the reminder here is when your kid asks you, when your sons ask you, when the people ask you, what is this? We give an answer that speaks of God's faithfulness yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, that we might be able to respond, oh, God is so faithful, God is so gracious. Oh, I blew it, but God is faithful because, you know, He still picks me up and dusts me off and says, hey, go on, come on with me. And, you know, the enemy would say, oh, you, you failed again, you rotten, dirty, rotten sinner. And, you know, God is saying, hey, come on. You know, He's urging His kids on that we might come, that we might follow Him, and that nothing would separate us from His love. In 15 and 16, it came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting you go, uh, letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and of the firstborn of the beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord uh, the males, the first offspring of every womb, but the firstborn uh, of my sons I redeem. I buy them back, he says, and uh, so it shall serve you as a sign. Uh, on your hand and as philatteries on your forehead for a powerful hand that the Lord has brought us out of Egypt. These little prayer boxes on their hand and their foreheads they think they uh, talk about is really those reminders 
of God's faithfulness. Uh, and they, they, they got them written upon their hand and they got them written upon their foreheads. And, and I think that uh, for us, uh, we, don't, uh, we might have a rubber band that says WWJD, or, uh, but we really entrust that, hey, Lord, you speak to me. You speak into my mind. I'm not, I don't have to put that box on my head. But you speak into my heart, you speak into my mind, the good things that you have done. God struck down the firstborn of the land of Egypt, but we his people, uh, the Jews, choose to dedicate their firstborn uh, as a conscious act of worship. You know, the conscious act of worship to the Lord in remembrance of what he's done for us. And I think that God never meant it that we just would go through the motions or the children of Israel would just go through the motions. And, and uh, I like that fact that, you know, uh, the fact is we have the Holy Spirit and he's that one, that constant reminder for us. And, you know, pray daily that the Lord will fill you afresh with the Spirit. Pray daily that the Lord would bring comfort and strength and instruction and conviction and inspiration for our lives because you know within our hearts there's so much garbage there's so much bad and even we think that hey we got rid of all that stuff but at times you know the ugliness of the remnant within there you know rears its ugly head and it, it can be kind of uh, ugly and you, you're surprised wow i thought that was gone but you know some of it's still in there and the lord is really trying to work it all out and it's a it's a thing that we say lord have your way come into the those rooms within my heart and clean out that ugliness, clean out that junk and have your way with me. Uh, for the Christian, I hope we dedicate all to him, guys, our hearts, our lives, our loved ones, all that he has entrusted to us, all of our time, all of our talent, all of our treasure. And, uh, 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 you know, you say that sometimes uh, we have so much time and, uh, well, we don't have time. I can't read the Word of God. I don't have time. I can't pray. And, uh, uh, but yet God says, hey, give me a little bit of your time. Give me a little bit of your talent. Serve me. Give me a little bit of your treasure because I've entrusted it to you. And really it says, hey, where's our heart at uh, with the Lord? And uh, I think that a lot of times uh, guys have a hard time. It's like that rich young ruler uh, the Lord says, hey, go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor, then come follow me. And he went away very sad because his, his riches held on to him and his riches held him uh, in, place, uh, in the place that he was at. And the Lord says, hey, it's, 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 uh, it's not that, but it's uh, where your heart is at in relationship to, to myself and to the, the things of your possessions that really possess you. And uh, these are the, the things that the Lord reminds us of. In 17 and 18, it came about when Pharaoh had let the people go that, the, that God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God says, lest the people change their minds when they see war, they return to Egypt. Uh, hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And uh, the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. God, is, God in his infinite wisdom knew his people's frailties, guys. The psalmist wrote, just as a, a father has compassion on his children, so the father has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. A God has breathed, uh, um, formed us out of the dust of the ground, guys, and he's breathed that life the breath of life into our nostrils. But yet he knew that hey, we weak and we frail. And, you know, when the challenges come at times, hey, we couldn't stand at that time. There may be a time that we can face up because of our relationship, because of our foundation in the Lord. But he says, hey, these people, these kids are just coming out of Egypt. They're just being delivered from this land of bondage, this land of slavery. And he says that, uh, 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 as hard as it was in Egypt, guys, the Lord knew that uh, as the people saw the Philistines, fear would fill their hearts and they would bolt for the safety of Egypt. And sometimes you, you know that uh, there are guys that live in abusive situations and, and they continue to go back to that abusive situation even as they're delivered from it. And you know, there are many theories, there are many uh, uh, things that people say, oh, why people uh, go back to these abusive situations. I, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he, he was 
pretty certain that the people would go back and vote back to the, the nation of Egypt saying, hey, at least we're safe there. Yeah, life was hard, but you know, we had the modicum of safety. It's more scary out here in the real world uh, than what we knew back there in Egypt. And uh, I, I think it, it all comes down to that step of faith, that walk of faith, that day by day we, we entrusting our lives to the Lord. Day by day we sing, Lord, uh, I need strength for the day. The book of Deuteronomy really speaks of he gives us strength for the day. And God is not giving us strength for the rest of our life or the next month or the next year or the next week, but he gives us strength to get through the day. And uh, I think that uh, like our daily bread, that, that, that daily provision of strength is there for us. And one of, one of his sons, uh, one of the tribes I know uh, in Deuteronomy uh, uh, says that he shall anoint your foot with oil. And he's, he's saying that, hey, I'm going to make your way, your path smoother. You know, if you go with me, if you allow me to anoint me and to lead you in my path. And it really says, hey, we got to stay in step with the Lord. we got to continue on with him. It's not, oh, okay, I, I, uh, I go in church on Wednesday. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I, I, I'm ready. But the rest of the week, uh, we're not following after the Lord. It's a daily thing, guys. And I'll say it again. Daily we pick up our cross. Daily we choose to follow after him. Daily we seek the Lord. Daily we seek his strength and his instruction and the light of his uh, his love for our lives, the, the light of his, uh, his word for us. Uh, rather than going uh, head on uh, to, to the, the situation, guys, wisdom said that the, the long way around was the way to go. Prudence and wisdom uh, is really the Lord's, uh, one of some of the Lord's attributes. And at times, we may choose to go the roundabout way or a different course to avoid potential conflict or a dangerous situation or a place of temptation. I continue to go back to um, that, that one fellow who, who was in the Salvation Army program. Uh, it, it, he couldn't walk through downtown. He couldn't go through downtown. He wasn't even supposed to drive through downtown from church to get back to the Salvation Army because uh, downtown was off limits for, for him and for uh, the program people. It was just a, a uh, in place, a safety measure that says, hey, go around from that place of danger. And the Lord said, hey, go around from that place of uh, potential danger as, as you face the Philistines. And sometimes you, you might have a dream, you might have a vision about people going into dark, dangerous places, and they're going into places that they should never even uh, consider entering in because uh, it's really filled with danger. It's really a place of darkness, and they shouldn't, they, they ought not to go there. Go a different way around. Avoid potential conflict or temptation or dangerous situations. Uh, Kaukonua uh, Nua Nahua Road on the North Shore, guys, has had many uh, bad accidents late at night or early in the morning. If you had to go to Haleiwa or to Wai, uh, Wailua late in the evening, wisdom might tell you to go the other way around without, without all the turns and the close oncoming traffic. For some reason, this narrow winding stretch of road is a magnet for speeders and impaired drivers. It always happens late at night. They go down that windy road, and bad things happen. And uh, uh, conventional prudence and wisdom says, hey, I'm not going to take that shortcut down to uh, the back way into Haleiwa, into Wailua, through that road, the, the, the twisty, windy road. I'm going to go the longer way around, but it's straight, the road is wide, and it's a lot safer. This is what the Lord did with the children of Israel. 19, hey, we racing home. Moses had, uh, took the bones of Joseph with him, uh, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God is surely, uh, will, shall surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here uh, with you. Joseph knew that his uh, final resting place should be at home in the promised land. He says, I don't belong here in Egypt, man. I, I belong in the Canaan land, in the land that God has promised us. And it's kind of like saying that, that you know, for our lives, we're not, re uh, we're not uh, resting here. We're not going to be here. You know, we're just passing through. We're going to the promised land, our promised land. For the child of God, we know our final resting place again. Uh, we have a land 
uh, we have uh, we have a hope laid up for us, hope in heaven, guys, and that's where our, our destination is. Um, then they set out from Sukkoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Uh, uh, in further, they moved uh, out as the Lord uh, went before them, guys. By faith, we move out seeking God's leading. Much of the way we go seeking God, the Lord's uh, changing of direction, not having it all laid out in stone, guys, but moving hopefully in, uh, in coordination with his will. We don't know what his will is, but we move and we say, Lord, lead me and guide me. Lord, change my direction if I'm going in the right, right direction. Open that right door, you know, as I knock, as I seek. And, you know, I love that. He says, keep knocking, keep seeking, keep moving, going in faith, uh, knowing that I have that way for you. I don't have it all laid out in stone, but moving hopefully in coordination with his will. At times, the ride is bumpy and even scary. Guys, you know, the children of Israel, they were scared. They left their homes of 400 years. And they say, we're striking out and we go, we're going into the wilderness. We got all these bad guys in front of us. We got the Egyptians there. You know, that's, that's uh, coming up. The Egyptians are going to be in back of us. But it gives us an opportunity to, to draw near to him and seek him as we are faced, uh, as we are faced, uh, uh, not to trust in ourselves or our own resources, but to trust Him. Because in of ourselves, we're pretty needy. But you know, if everything is smooth, everything is going no, no rough bumps and all that, hey, why call on God? Hey, I got Him, God. Oh, God, you're so good. Thanks, I got Him, man. It's all good. And uh, see you later. And you know, some have said that. But uh, that, that bumpy rose, that scariness dr keeps us on our knees in prayer. Uh, here in 21, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and a pillar of fire to lead them at night to give them light that they might travel by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night uh, from before the people. God was faithful to allow his people to come under the shelter of his covering, guys. Uh, like the cooling canopy of a shady tree on a hot day, guys, and a f uh, fiery light to chase away the, the darkness of, uh, by light, guys, at night. So too the, the Lord still provides for us today that covering, that shelter, uh, that, that light uh, unto our path, that, that lamp is unto our feet, guys. God, God takes away a lot of the fear, the scariness, as he reassures us he's, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, God is faithful, guys, and uh, uh, we'll continue on uh, uh, in our study next week. Don't forget to engage your life with him. Engage it in worship. Engage it in prayer. Engage it in the word. Be, uh, be blessed as you fellowship with other believers or message one another, whatever it might be a word of encouragement, or be blessed as you receive a word of encouragement, and uh, uh, continue to pray for one another. Father God, we do want to thank you. Lord, what a great and uh, awesome God you are, Lord, so faithful, Lord, and we look forward uh, uh, to fully entering, entering into that place, uh, a land flowing with milk and honey one day, and uh, we thank you for the abundance of your love, Lord. We thank you for the fullness of joy that you give us, Lord. And it all comes in the relationship we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. And I know John's uh, first epistle, he speaks of that, Lord, uh, the fullness of joy that comes from the love of Jesus Christ, Father. And we do thank you, Lord. We do praise you for your faithfulness. We thank you for rescuing us and delivering us, Lord, and giving us the reminder of your faithful plans and purposes for our lives. We continue to offer up the sacrifices of praise, Lord. We continue to come before you daily, Lord, offering up our lives as living sacrifices, Lord, holy and pleasing unto you. May we truly uh, live our lives in that light, in that vein, all to the glory of God. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.